imagine not seeing your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. Imagine them being somewhere else and you know that they're not safe. It just all worked out. Um, it was totally part of God's plan is what I believe. Um, and my name was changed from Tatiana to Jessica, Jessica Long. When you are grinding day after day after day, there is no room in you for hope. that just like I felt bad for they, they didn't want to talk to anyone honestly because their moms was in the airports and stuff and they were stuck and like I'm thankful for having my entire family here like my brothers and my sisters but like imagine not seeing your mother your father your brother your sister imagine them being somewhere else and you know that they're not safe you know because of the war there's a big war civil war and because they want to get their family to a safe place they cannot do that this president he doesn't feel what people are feeling I feel in America is like my country, is, is like my second country. But right now, I feel like I'm different. You know, in the GFK, they, I, I travel only a month and, and 20 days. And you know, when you come back, they pull you over. They, they ask you a lot of questions. They take your phone. They have to see inside what you have, what picture you have. We trap, we cannot move, you know? We are legally here. We want to go back and come back, do business, but we're scared because we don't know what the officer at the border will react against us. Chad is an active member of G5 in Sahel who fighting against the terrorism in the region. We are victims of, of terrorism in our country, in our market, in our different city, our villages are victims of this. We, we're scared to go outside. We are trying to create my own business. I create my own company to make connection between the United States, Canada, and all the African French-speaking countries. It's a business opportunity we have here to help our people to do business with the United States. Actually, my mom is sick. I want her to come to U.S. so we can uh, see her, we can take care of her. Because the war in Yemen and many people die, many people get killed. So we are worried about uh, our family. We worry, I'm worried about my mom too. We can live without business. It's not a big deal, but uh, we can't live without family. Roma. I'm 36 years, a native and citizen of Sierra Leone. I'm in a South Texas detention complex in South Texas. I arrived on the 17th of January this 2017, and then they took me to like four detention centers. I left Sierra Leone because of the persecution I suffered. Fortunately, I get visa to get to Brazil. I continue my journey through uh, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia. I came into Panama, Costa Rica. We were smuggled from Nicaragua, came to Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico. For Simon, it means that he is in, in danger of being returned back to his home country. Um, but he is in fear of returning back to his home country because of the persecution that he has suffered or that he fears that he will suffer if he's forced to return. Our organization has noticed that there's a consistently um, good number of individuals from sub-Saharan Africa that are detained at the Pearsall Detention Center. Once a refugee or migrant arrives at the U.S. border, they uh, have some sort of interaction with 
CBP, which is uh, the Customs and Border Patrol. If it's someone that's seeking asylum or uh, like a refugee, if they express some level of fear of returning to their home country, that should technically enter them into the asylum process. In, in Pearsall, it appears very much like a jail setting with no guarantee of when they're ever going to be free and just waiting around really for their court hearing. They told me that uh, my case has been postponed to the 26th of September and uh, later they also postponed it to the 28th. And finally I have uh, the individual hearing and uh, after the hearing the judge told me that he could not take the decision then. Uh, I need to wait for uh, October 12th. A really big frustration for a lot of these uh, detainees at Pearsall is the wait. My lawyer went and the, the, the, law, the judge said that uh, my asylum is denied. Individuals who have suffered so much trauma in their home country, unfortunately that trauma can become normalized and then they don't think to share it to with us or to the judge when it's so vital that they do that. I'm tired. I've been in detention for nine months and spending another eight months in detention would be too disastrous for me. Green card avantajıyla geldik. Sırada ben Türkiye'de gazetecilik yapıyordum, spor muhabirliği yapıyordum ulusal bir televizyon ajansında. Arkadaşım aslında üniversitede okurken arkadaşım başvuru yaptı, hem benim adım hem kendi adına. Sonra tesadüfen bana çıktı. Başvuran oydu ama biz bize çıktı tesadüfen. Sonra bir belli bir aşaması var zaten süresi. O süreden sonra vize aldıktan sonra buraya geldik. Malum yeni geliyorsunuz. E, dil çok azdı Türkiye'den. İlk geldiğimde boyacılık. Yani gazetecilikten boyacılığa bir, bir anda bir yüzde yüz bir değişiklik arıyorum. Yani ufak bir şehre gideyim. Kendime ait bir iş yerim olsun. Kendime ait bir evim, bir düzenim olsun istedim. Tesadüfen franchise firması da e, Texas e, kökenliydi. Houston'da ilk e, yerleri vardı. İşte konuştuk ettik dedi ki işte franchise şirketinin sahibi ya böyle böyle El Paso'da bir yer var. E, Bordo şehri. Aslında benim hayalimdi. Beş yıl önce ilk geldiğimde bir e, Türk restoranı açmak. Bizim de ustamız e, kendisi New York'tan getirdik. O da sağ olsun bize e, öğretiyor. Bizim genelde Türk yemekleri e, sulu yemek değil ama kebaplarımız meşhurdur. Tatlılarımız meşhur. E, bir Türk mutfağından verilebilecek ne varsa hepsini hemen hemen çıkartıyoruz. Türkler ve Araplardan zaten hiç fazla gelen yok ama genelde benim şaşırtan beni hani ben genelde Meksikalılar için dedik hani Meksikalılar gelir çünkü sayılı aileler var buradan iş yapan buranın yerlileri var. Ha, tabii ki onlar da geliyor ama yüzde 70 75 civarı hep Amerikalılar gelmeye başladı. Yani İstanbul aşığı bir insanım zaten. Bir gün hani herkes üniversitedeki bir hocamın dediği bir cümle vardı kullandı her zaman için bize. Hani geçmişi unutun, bugünü anlayın, geleceği yaşayın diye. Ben hep o, e, şeyden, o felsefede, felsefede yani. ilerleyen bir insan. I was born to a young single Russian girl. Uh, she was 16 when she had me. Um, just wasn't able to take care of a disabled baby. My name is Jessica Long, and I am a 13-time Paralympic gold medalist in swimming, and this is my story. I was actually adopted from Irkutsk, Russia when I was 13 months old. I was born to a young, single Russian girl. Uh, she was 16 when she had me, um, just wasn't able to take care of a disabled baby. And I was born with fibular hemimalia, which basically means I was missing both of my lower legs. Um, I had a foot with three toes. Um, 
But because of my birth defect, she was not able to care for me, so she put me up for adoption. And during this time, there was an American couple in Baltimore, Maryland, who they wanted to, to grow their family. And they already had two children, but they weren't able to have any more. So they looked into adoption, and they were at a church event, and a, they were asking around if anyone was looking into adoption. And I believe it was that moment that my parents decided to adopt me and another little boy from Russia who later became my brother. My grandparents came to the BWI airport and got us and drove us all the way to my parents' home and my mom walked out of the house and I went right into her arms and Josh just started playing um, and we were just welcomed into this new family. It just all worked out. Um, it was totally part of God's plan, is what I believe. Um, and my name was changed from Tatiana to Jessica, Jessica Long. The first Paralympics I ever competed in was the 2004 Paralympic Games in Athens, Greece. And I was 12 years old, and I was not expected to make the team. So there I am swimming as hard as I can, a little 12 year old, so tiny. And at the flip turn at the, the halfway mark, I was fifth. So I was not, was falling behind. But um, my parents, they would t tell me the race, they were there and they said, you know, it was amazing to see me come from pretty much last to just catching the world record holder, the current world record holder. And we're coming, you know, neck and neck and um, we're 15 meters out. And I remember saying, you know, I did not come here to get second. And we swim into the wall as hard as we can and we touch within a tenth of a second. And when you think about that, that's a, a fingernail. It was so close, I mean, I had to look up at the scoreboard to see who even won. And there it was, a little one next to my name, Jessica Long, and I had just outtouched the world record holder for the gold medal, uh, my first race ever. The crowd goes crazy and, you know, the first people I look for are my parents. And I remember being nervous if I could raise my hand in victory or not. Um, but that was the start of it. You know, that, that one race um, was the start of my whole career. And when I was 16, I competed at the Paralympics in Beijing, China, and I won four gold, silver, and bronze. And then when I was 20, I competed at the Paralympics in London, England, and I won five gold, two silver, and a bronze. And at my last Paralympics in Rio de Janeiro, I was 24 and I won a gold, three silver, and two bronze. And my next step is to compete at the 2020 Paralympics in Tokyo, Japan. No pressure, no pressure. Ready, go. At that point, it's gonna be like 18 years of um, competitive swimming. I'm still keeping my body sharp um, in the weight room. Good morning, Jess. Hey. How are you today? Good. One step closer to this world championship. One, two. Good. I'm gonna go 30 seconds straight here. 30 seconds, good. You got it. You know, I've really learned that I don't have anything left to prove in the sport of Paralympics. So for me, these next three years going into Tokyo, it's, it's really for myself. Tokyo will be my last one. Um, number five, which I think is crazy. But I'm really excited and I'm gonna give it all that I have in these next three years. So some things I'm really considering once my swimming career ends, I'm becoming a swim coach. And last year I um, was a coach for the St. Paul School for Girls swim team. It was really, it was so fun, you know, just getting to know these little girls and seeing, you know, during difficult sets when they didn't give up. For me, I'll be coaching again this year and I'm really looking forward to it. Swim on 45 and that's hard. You'll be adding, yeah, you'll be going a little bit faster on that. And then you are going in 30 seconds. So six times through. Let's go, girls. Let's go. Keep it up. Right before the London 2012 Paralympics, I opened up with a Russian news station and said, yeah, you know, I think it would be a cool idea to meet my family one day. And little did I know that from that little statement that I said, something I wanted to do maybe two, three years from down the road, the Russian reporter went and found my family. The next year, the following year, is when I went to Russia. I decided to take my little sister Hannah over with me to Russia. And it's really interesting, when I look back, I can see like how incredibly numb I was to the whole 
leading up to Russia. I knew that maybe one day I really wanted to be my birth mom. It was something that I could really picture, like I knew of her, this idea of her. Um, but I never thought that years later um, that she had married my biological father and, and that they had the three children and that I was the oldest. You know, I was, I mean, what can prepare you for meeting your, your birth family? And I was going to Russia and I didn't have my security blankets. You know, I, I, was, I was in this different country and I was not really even sure why I was heading over there. But when we did arrive over in Russia, finally, it was my first time ever meeting them. It was hard, you know? My first encounter was um, when I first hugged my mom. It just was very eye-opening to see that this could have been my, my home and my family. I mean, you don't even know what to think, you know? You're meeting this family. And she had claimed, my birth mother, um, Natalia, had talked about how they were planning to come back and get me, to get me when I was three years old. But again, I don't know how much, this is all through translation, so um, that was really, you know, hard to hear. But at the same time, the whole reason I went back to Russia was, you know, I really wanted to meet this family that, um, you know, my birth family. And I wanted to let my birth mom know that I was not angry with her and that, no matter what, I was really thankful that she put me up for adoption. There's so many people who need hope in this world and they need a good role model and they need something that they are passionate about. And um, there's gonna be really, really tough times. And this is something that I, I say a lot, but when you are given those, when you are given a circumstance that you can't control, it is in those moments that you have to look at your situation and just know that you are gonna have a good outcome with, um, just pushing through and, and being, having perseverance and knowing that no matter what comes your way, that you can overcome it. And I feel like I'm living proof of that. You know, I was never, ever expected to, to go as far as I have. I just simply wanted to tell a story of men who are able to transcend the beliefs they've had all their lives. want nothing more than to live Afghanistan. That is what we want too. It was a real moment in, in Cold War history in that no general secretary after the invasion of Afghanistan had sat across the table from a president of the United States. The word trust comes up often in the play. Can we trust you? How can we trust you? How can we trust someone who hated communism so vehemently to, that suddenly he decides that he wants to have a one-on-one -on -one with the general secretary. And so it, it, the first act is a lot about finding that uh, common ground and two people learning to trust one another. You invaded Afghanistan as a way to impose socialist ideas on a country that had no interest. No, no! They asked for our help. I was really thrilled to get the part. And, it, you know, he's a really interesting personality as a person. Put the historical thing to one side. He, he also was famous for relying on his instincts, but also his principles. Who do you believe yourself to be? A lifeguard. Each day, more people are lost, bodies wash ashore, the threat grows greater, the waters more dangerous. I started to write the play and I realized that Reagan himself was a bit of an enigma. He could pivot, which is a wonderful thing uh, in many politicians. He could change. He followed his own course and his own instincts. Uh, did you enjoy your time in Hollywood? You really don't want to let me walk out that door, do you? It's an easy enough question. Mm. This is Hollywood. The American people gave me a four-picture deal. Mr. Shevin Nadzik, what does the General Secretary believe will come from these talks? No comment. No comment. For a first-timer, he was good. I will have to check on that. Well, I think the topic. lesson is that you, you can't, you, you have to sit in a room with the opposing force and talk to one another. When you have two striking personalities who are so set in their ways 
and how they shift and how they change and how they smile. They become friends. The conditions were pretty terrible. I once told someone that I learned to fight with a knife long before I learned how to ride a bicycle. And when you are grinding day after day after day, there is no room in you for hope. You don't even know it exists. There, there's nothing to aspire to except fill in your hungry belly. That's how I was raised. When I was 12, a bookmobile came to the fields. And you have to understand that I wasn't allowed to have books because books are heavy. And when you're moving a lot, you have to keep things just as minimal as possible. So when I first saw this big vehicle on the side of the road and it was filled with books, I immediately stepped back. Fortunately, when the staff members saw me, kind of waved me in said, these are books, and you could take one home. I'm like, what's the catch? And he explained to me there was no catch. Then he asked me what I was interested in. And the night before the bookmobile had come, in the camps, there was an elder who was telling us about the day that Mount Rainier blew up. So I told the bookmobile person that I was a little nervous about the mountain blowing up. And he said to me, the more you know about something, the less you will fear it. And he gave me a book about volcanoes. And then I saw a book about dinosaurs. I said, oh, that looks neat. So he gave me a book about dinosaurs. And I took them home, and I devoured them. I didn't just read them. I devoured them. And I came back in two weeks and had more questions. And he gave me more books, and that started it. That taught me that hope was not just a word. And it gave me the courage to leave the camps. That's where the books made the difference. By the time I was 15, I knew there was a world outside of the camps. I believed I could find a place in it, and I did.